Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast. It's the expert dietitian, Lauren Nash. I'm here with Geordie Sullivan. Geordie, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? Lawrence? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. How good, was, uh, how good was your post when the um when you did the auto captions and it would have come up with, hey, Tame? Yeah, hey, Tame, don't fall off your back. <laughs> auto you captions are so funny, them. hey, like when you put them up and then it just comes up with the most random words. Whenever I do one with... um. And it says Israel Adesanya. It comes up with this funny. I can't remember. It's like it's like in a soup or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried it with the Instagram captions to see if that was any better than the app I used. But it came when I said going to jump on the podcast with Jordy Sullivan. It said like Gordon Sullivan. <laughs> well, she used to get called Gordon back in high school. To be honest, so yeah, I might start calling you Gordo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but what anyway, are we uh, what? talking about? Yeah, what we're talking about today. So we're following on with our little endurance journey that we're doing. Um, and today's going to be all about carbs, which people are probably sick of us talking about carbs. But as we all know, carbs are, carbs are king. They're our favorite fuels. So what we're going to talk about in today's episode is the good old carbohydrate loading before an event. And then also breaking down intra nutrition because in our previous podcast, we did touch on pre, during and post training nutrition, but we were going to save intra training nutrition for its own episode because it's pretty complex. There's a lot of things to consider. And to be honest, I think it's worthy of its own episode so yeah just going to be talking about carbs before carbs during exercise really is what we're going to be doing today yeah we spent a lot of time talking about carbs and i feel like people are going to be banging their head on but it's important like people still don't get it i feel like i talk to so many people and it's obviously there's so much misinformation out there and they just go oh do i really have to have that many carbs it's like yes you've got to have that many carbs plus some yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, hopefully by the time we finish this series, everyone will be like, okay, 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 I get it. Carbs are my friend. I shouldn't be scared of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's kick it off. This is a cool topic to kick this one off is carb loading because carb loading has changed so much over the years. Like I remember learning, I remember learning about it back even when I was in high school, like doing athletics and things. And yeah. what we got taught back then was so different to what I got taught at university. And I feel like even nowadays, we've kind of changed our tone on what mm-hmm. we talk about when we say carb loading. So give us a brief overview. You tell the people at home, what is carb loading? Let's start there. Yeah, for sure. So I think when you think of carb loading, you're probably thinking of smashing like a massive bowl of pasta or something the night before training. Cause I know when, back when I used to skate, my coaches was like, make sure you have pasta before your competition. Yeah. <laughs> but back then, you know, carb loading for me was one meal. Um, so ultimately what carbohydrate loading is, it's a process where we adopt a higher carbohydrate intake for a few days before an event um, to increase our muscle glycogen stores, which if you've been following along, you know that muscle glycogen is one of our primary fuel sources for exercise. Um, and typically by carbohydrate loading, we're achieving like a super high level of carbs within our body. So given our body can only store, you know, a certain amount of um, muscle and liver glycogen at once, we're quite limited to the amount of glycogen we carry. So before an event, the goal is to try and increase these stores so that come game day, we've got some extra fuel in the tank um, to get us started. So typically, um, you know, it's done in those few days leading up to training and and we'll go over it, but you know, there's kind of some different types of protocols that you can do. Um, But Typically in that week before you do an event, naturally with your training, you're going to be tapering your exercise load. So what this is already helping us to do is we're not tapping into those glycogen stores as much as normal. So instead of having a super high training load, which you would normally in the in the weeks leading up to your event, you're already exercising at a either lower intensity or long, lower lesser duration sessions. So we're already not using as much glycogen as normal. And then we're increasing our dietary intake. So the two together causes a massive increase in our glycogen stores um and yeah there are a few different ways to do it Jordy, have you ever done a carb load or like have you ever had an experience where you maybe you followed a certain protocol yeah yeah i've done a couple um i usually do it over two days two days is what i do yeah. and it's, a, it's quite a lot of carbs i can get up to nowadays i can get up about 11 12 grams per day which we're about to go over i'm sure lots yeah. will give you the the details yeah. but um it was definitely tough it took me a little while to get the balance right especially like mm-hmm. what you're talking about with the exercise because you still want to exercise like well i do especially when i've got an event or something a big mm-hmm. training session that you do load up for i feel good if i still move around and do some things but like Lo says you can't go too hard at those sessions because if you do carb deplete too hard and don't put enough in you do feel it once you get to that competition or race or even if it's a bigger training session so getting a coach i found is really really useful to make sure you do do a proper taper and your taper is going to be dependent on what the rest of your training look like what did the last 6 8 12 14 16 however many weeks of training what did that look like 
that's mm-hmm. going to determine your taper. But getting a good carbohydrate load is really good. I, I felt really good when I whenever I've done it. It takes practice, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It takes a lot of practice, but it's definitely worth doing. Absolutely. And this is again where, you know, that kind of nutritional training comes in, which we've mentioned before, Jordi, is the training the gut. It's a similar thing here because you want to be, you know, gradually increasing your daily carbohydrate intake. So come the day when you do have to do a carbohydrate load, it's not, holy crap, this is like so, you know, out of like, this is just not normal. I feel super uncomfortable. So this is again where as an athlete, having a high habitual carbohydrate intake comes in handy because come those few days before an event where you are increasing your carbs, if you traditionally have a super low carbohydrate diet and then bam, you're having, you know, up to 11 grams per kilogram of your body weight, you're going to feel a bit heavy. You might feel a bit sluggish. You might feel uncomfortably full. Um, So this is again, just a reminder that one, go back to our first episode and listen to where we spoke about training your gut because it's going to come in handy for this process as well. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely train your gut. I know we said that probably about 17,000 times in the <laughs> what, two and a bit episodes we've been doing this. So, yeah. so, so important. Like, can I, I would say I have that convo multiple times every single day. Every single working day, I get DMs about this is, oh man, like, I just can't get this to sit right. And it's like, oh, well, how long have you been practicing? Like, oh, I just tried it. It's like, of course, yeah. like, you never go into the gym and just expect to squat 200 kilos. It's not like you can just expect to put 10 grams per kilo of carbs in your system and your body be like, oh yeah, man, this is cool. <laughs> That's exactly right. So pretty much let's go through a few of the protocols for carbohydrate loading. So as I mentioned, you know, we've got stored carbohydrate in our liver, uh, which is the type of energy that, you know, fuels our body overnight while we're fasting. And then we've got muscle glycogen. So in the muscle glycogen particles are distributed throughout the muscle and this supports the local energy needs of our muscles during exercise so they can fire really quickly. So traditional approaches, as I mentioned before, used to kind of be a multiple day of training on a really low carbohydrate diet, followed by three days or so of tapered training on a really high carbohydrate diet. So ultimately during those first few days, you're depleting your glycogen stores. So you're kind of starting from a negative balance, so to speak. And then you're having an extremely high carbohydrate diet to increase your carbs um, across those few days. However, there's been, you know, a lot of science, a lot of advances in research and everything over the last few years. And it seems like these traditional approaches of extreme glycogen depletion and then increasing your carb intake might actually be pretty unnecessary and not really warranted for um, the general, you know, population. It's also a lot to consider as well. And you don't want to be training you know, super low, which we're going to go into in our next podcast, the train low, compete high principles type of thing. But mentally as well, if you're not used to training on a low carbohydrate diet, if you're doing so for a few days, you know, you could put yourself at an increased risk of injury or, you know, having a bad session and then getting in a bad mindset, I think, for the event. So I also agree that I kind of, I'm glad protocols are shifting away a little bit from this side, um, from that lower carbohydrate training during the week. But of course, it still has its place. Um, but yeah, these days... Um, you know, there's a few other methods, which could even just be three to one to three days before your event. Um, and that could be intakes of say eight to 12 grams of your kilogram body weight um, in carbohydrates, say 36 to 48 hours before your competition in combination with an exercise taper. So again, similar principles, but just less extreme. So we're slowly reducing our energy expenditure and increasing our carbohydrate intake. So both of those together are going to increase our body's glycogen stores. Um, And there's, you know, even enough evidence to support that a one day carbohydrate load could be effective. Um, So say having around 10 to 12 grams of high carbohydrates per kilogram of your body weight. Again, this is um, specific to yourself um, just for one day prior to the event can also be sufficient amount of carbs to fuel that next day's event. Yeah, I like the one day one as well. And that's something I program into all of our endurance athletes. Say if they Saturday is usually a massive training day for for most people, obviously, because it's the weekend. I program Fridays to kind of be a practice taper day for these guys. If we were actually doing a taper, we usually do yeah, anywhere between 36 and 48 hours. But most Fridays, there's a practice taper day where you're loading up and we're aiming for about 10 grams per kilo. And it might sound like a lot. And the first couple of times you try it, yeah, absolutely it is. But you get way, way, way better at it. And mm-hmm. the thing is, you all of them say, hey, I feel so much better on that Saturday if we do that kind of mini load on that day before and it's a lot of carbs and like we keep saying you got to practice it but getting used to it and then putting it into your training schedule even if your friday is like a rest day for a lot of guys and i've done programs where my friday was always like a rest day or a really light training day and then on the saturday we had the big training session still do it still load up still get those carbohydrates in because it's going to 
give you so much more energy come that Saturday big session. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really great idea that, you know, you're getting these guys to get comfortable with that feeling and with that kind of preparation so that, yeah, come race day, you know, you're getting up (laughs) early in the morning, you probably don't have to worry about having a super high carb breakfast because you've already loaded the day before as well. So I think it's good um, because with the whole carbohydrate loading process, I, I mean, I know what it used to be like when I used to compete, you feel anxious, you feel nervous. Sometimes, you know, that morning of an event, it is actually can be quite hard to get in a really substantial meal. So say you're getting up at what, 4am or something to get ready for an Ironman, you've got maybe two, three, four hours before the event. Obviously, yes, we want to get a nice big meal, but you you might be feeling a bit anxious. You might really struggle to stomach a solid meal. So coming into that event, I feel with a decent carbohydrate load, you know, you've already set yourself up really well. Um, If say, for instance, on that next morning, you did struggle to get in a good meal. I think having those carbs on board already takes away a little bit of the stress of having a really good um, high carbohydrate breakfast. But yeah, as you mentioned, you know, that is a lot of carbohydrates. If we're looking to say, you know, 10 to 12, 8 to 12 grams of um, carbs per kilogram of body weight for a 70 kilo person, that's 560 to 840 grams of carbs. That's almost a kilo of carbohydrates. Like if you put it into that context, like that is a lot of carbs and you know, people are so scared of carbs. They're probably thinking, holy crap, no way would I ever do that. But again, this is where what type of carbs we have can play a role as well. So we talk about high GI um, and low GI carbs or like kind of your complex carbs and your simple carbs. And the easiest way to kind of get those massive um, amounts of carbs in would be opting for your high GI carbohydrates. Um, And as we know as well, those simple carbohydrates um, support muscle glycogen repletion um, a lot more efficiently than complex because they take a lot longer to digest and absorb. Um, So when we're talking about your high GI carbohydrates, you know, that is things like your white pastas, your white rice, um, white breads, not necessarily lollies and stuff, but, you know, those type of simple sugars um, that are going to increase our glycogen stores quickly. So they're the types of things that we want to be filling up on during those carbohydrate loads. Um, and also just eating familiar foods as well. You know, don't go from during your training camp, you have, you never really eat rice for some reason, or maybe you don't really eat potatoes and then come that carbohydrate load because you just really need to get so many carbohydrates and you're taking carbs, carbs, carbs. Um, so I think, yeah, make sure you're eating familiar foods as well during that period. Um, because like we say with everything, don't try anything new on race day. And it also comes the same for your carb load. You know, you don't want to try anything new the few days before as well. So I think sticking to what you know and over the course of your preparation for your event, become more comfortable eating higher carbohydrate portions as well. Yeah, and you'll find foods that you feel better on. Like you could hit yeah. these numbers using all different types of foods. Like, like I'm a 70 kilo guy and that's what I aim for mm-hmm. on the day before, like my Saturday big sessions. And I've hit those numbers in so many different foods, whether it's, you know, like pizzas or burgers or lots of sweet potato fries or whatever it is. And I've just found foods that feel good. And it's just, and it's kind of is, it's a mix of those foods that some people would be like, oh, that's a bit naughty. You shouldn't be eating that. But it's like, yeah, well, we kind of have to do that to hit these numbers. But it's also a mix. Like I really enjoy having like sweet potato fries and homemade, like Mm -hmm. homemade pizzas where you make the dough and kind of staying away from like lots of oily foods. But I know I have clients who just love like going out and getting heaps of Subway and they feel good and they hit insanely good numbers the next day. So it is very individualized and you know, if smashing five bowls of Cocoa Pops is what you really like doing and you feel good and you perform well the next day, that's awesome. Keep it up, but do play around with it and experiment it. And each week, like you could try different combinations, but make mental notes, make notes and then make physical notes, write it down. How did I feel? Like when I started, what was that first hour? Like, did I wake up? Did I feel like a bit grumbly? Did I feel hungry when I woke up? How Mm -hmm. did I feel like during my warm up? Was I like lethargic? Was I like slow to click on? Like, how fast did my body start activating, start turning on? Like how long did it take me to get into my rhythm and into my pace? Like all of those things are important because they're all indications of how well you nailed that strategy the day before. Yeah, I think it's such a great um, kind of underrated tool is just having that kind of self-reflection and taking notes of how you did feel during training. Because like we keep saying, you know, you want to practice this stuff the same way you practice your physical training in the lead up to an event. So taking note of, oh, I had, you know, two bowls of Cocoa Pops with like a banana um, this day and I ran really good on the sub day or, you know, this day I had like some potato and like I felt pretty crap and sluggish so I think it's yeah becoming familiar with foods that work for you because like you said what works for me won't work for you and what works for us won't work to the person who's listening to this episode so I think becoming familiar with foods that feel comfortable for you or work for you regardless of what other people think is um super underrated too I think but yeah I guess in terms of carbohydrate loading 
ultimately you're looking at that week before an event or a heavy training day, like you were saying, um, and it could be three days before, could be one day before, but ultimately getting up to say at least around that 10 grams per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrates, opting for high GI, and this is pairing with an exercise taper as well. So ultimately this is going to load your body, load your skeletal muscle with glycogen. So that come race day or come that really big session, you've got this extra fuel reserves, so to speak, to help power you through those longer sessions um, that are over 90 minutes, which if you're listening to this, you're probably doing training sessions over 90 minutes. This is a good point too. I'm pretty sure you are just going to make this point. I'm going to steal it off you is that yeah. obviously when we're stocking up all these glycogen stores, we're going to be storing a lot of water weight. So mm-hmm. glycogen, it's kind of debated how much water goes on anywhere between two and four grams. And the number doesn't really matter. What you need to know is that the more glycogen you have in your body, the more water you're going to have in your body. I think that's a great thing. Like the more water you have in there, because as we've spoken about so many different times, on the podcast is dehydration is such mm-hmm. a debilitating factor when it comes to performance. So having more water, no matter where it is put in that body for use to, to help mitigate that dehydration is a good thing. I have had athletes who do these mini tapers or mini carbohydrate loads or even a proper carb load. And then they wake up and they go, Holy smokes, I'm so heavy. And you're like, well, <laughs> it's okay. Like you just, you just stocked up on fuel. Like it's a good yeah. thing. Like if you wake up and you were lighter the next day, I'd be like, what happened like did you just like phantom get up and run a marathon and just burn on your fuels or did you phantom get up and do like chin-ups and push-ups or whatever it's like you kind of want to wake up heavy because it means that you've got all those fuels stocked up and you've got that fluid it's absolutely fine it's just something to be mindful of yeah for sure and I think if you're not used to having that carbohydrate or if you are someone that regularly monitors your weight and you do notice holy crap there's a massive change yeah don't stress it's not like you've gained you know a kilo of fat overnight you've probably gained a kilo of water because yeah glycogen and water are buddies and they like to be together so the more glycogen you have in your body the more water you're going to have as well which really good point in terms of helping with hydration because same thing with you know people always think about okay yep carb loading but it's really important in those days leading up to your event as well we always talk about carbohydrate loading but making sure you are hydrated in those days before your event as well not just waiting until the day of to get all your water in um, you want to come into that event also adequately hydrated so great point carbs water should be good to go for your long session or your event let's make a mental point there to talk about that when we talk about hydration and electrolytes because recently i've changed my tone on about how effective the water that is attached to glycogen is in overall hydration during training let's but we'll talk about that's a little teaser of and i could be completely wrong this is just some theory that i had one day when i was running and i i think i'm right but i'll discuss it with you Loz, on the podcast when we do that yeah no that sounds really good and i think yeah hydration and electrolyte specific podcast is on the menu anyway so it sounds good and uh we can see if it was something you just came up while you were delusional 25 kilometers into a run or something or if you've actually yeah, maybe maybe i was dehydrated and i thought i was having a great idea but my brain was just skitzy now yeah while you're like imagining wasn't thinking. Just in the future <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right uh last anything else we need to cover before we go into carb intake during an event no i don't think so i reckon that summarizes carbohydrate loading all right let's jump into it yeah that's good that's good carb intake during a big training of uh, session or an event what's to go with it Yeah, definitely. So as we've said, carbohydrates are our preferred source of fuel. So not only are we going to be preparing our bodies with carbohydrates, but we want to be providing more carbohydrates whilst we're exercising because during, you know, our intense and prolonged exercise, this glycogen, um, these glycogen particles, they're broken down and the glucose, which is the sugar, um, which is what glycogen is made up of, are released. And this is what can get oxidized or burned as fuel during exercise. And this is what creates our ATP which again, if you listen to our podcast, you'll know that ATP is our body's energy currency. So ultimately glycogen is broken down into glucose. This glucose is then oxidized and you're going to hear us talking about oxidation and all those fancy words um, coming up. But ultimately the rate at which this muscle glycogen is broken down depends on the intensity. So for example, are you running a marathon at like a two minute um, two minute per kilometer race or like a seven kilometer pace um, is going to also impact the rate at which this fuel is broken down. Um, but pretty much, as we mentioned, you know, our glycogen stores are super small. So longer bouts of exercise, we're going to need to provide our body with more fuel. So we call this exogenous carbohydrates. So before I go into that, what endogenous carbohydrates are is that kind of refers to the muscle and the liver glycogen that we already have stored. So endogenous is internal. Um, so think of it like that way. And then exogenous carbohydrates, which if you listen to my reel the other day of me trying to talk and ride a bike, I did talk about is um, ultimately exogenous carbohydrates is the glucose that we can get from food. Um, 
So during exercise, this is what we want to aim to do. So by having carbohydrates during your exercise, your body can burn that glucose that's come from the food and spare burning muscle glycogen for as long as possible. So this is ultimately what helps us kind of kick, the, um, kick that fatigue can down the road um, and try and use that immediate energy that's circulating in our blood um, before we tap into our glycogen stores. So I guess this, you know, there's a lot of recommendations in terms of how much you should be having depending on duration, depending on intensity. But ultimately, if you're training for longer than an hour and a half, you really want to start um, taking some carbohydrates in. Um, so pretty much the guidelines are, you know, if it's less than 60 minutes, you probably don't need any carbs. Um, maybe if you want, you could have like some sports drink or something super easy, um, but probably not required. Um, once you exceed that 60 minute mark, say 60 to 120 minutes, so you've got that one to two hour mark, you probably get away with around 30 grams of carbs an hour, which is, you know, equivalent to maybe like one and a half gels or, or a medium banana, um, maybe like one piece of bread with like a, a heap teaspoon of jam or something like that. So you're looking at quite a decent um, amount of carbohydrates. And then um, as we get like further in, we go up to around 60 grams of carbs per hour. And then once we hit that two and a half hour mark is when you wanna be trying to aim for 90 grams of carbs per hour. Um, and there's actually some studies to show up to about 120 grams of carbs per hour are really beneficial to maintain exercise intensity. So you're looking at, depending on your intensity and, and the length of your session, 30 to upwards of 120 grams of carbohydrates um, per hour. So yeah, before we go into, I guess the mixing of carbs and everything, Jordy. What's, what's your intake on like when you're exercising, you know, do you have numbers that you aim for or have you found kind of a magic number that works for you? Yeah, I've been able to get up to about 80 grams per nice. hour. You know, it took a while. It's definitely hard and you got to play around with it. Like you've definitely got to play around with different sources. Yep. And um, like we're about to talk about with the, with the transport, the mixed sources, it's really important that you do mix those sources because if you do have just one source and you keep smashing it you do feel different like you just feel like something's just sitting in your gut and it's not really getting through so make mm -hmm. sure and you're mixing the different carbohydrate sources which we're about to get to but again like we've said it what seventeen thousand and one times now you just <laughs> got to practice it like you've got to practice this and it's hard because it's it's somewhat difficult because you're never gonna exactly get these numbers it's not mm -hmm. like you're gonna like bang on get 30 grams like a banana for example like a normal size banana can be anywhere from 25 to 35 even 40 if it's like a massive one gram so it's like you grab a yeah. banana and you're like okay i think like this is 30 grams and i've got to mix it with a couple rice cakes and you know how much of that is like five ten grams and that's like you're never gonna get it exactly on roundabout numbers are really good and then just start pushing them up and then like just start increasing them and see how you feel because again like you want to get it used to your gut like your gut used to getting them in you want to get like if you're on a bike you literally need to figure out the mechanics of how you get this like how you open a gel and how you get it in and then like still be able to concentrate and digest that and still put fluids in all of those things just take practice but i always say to people it's probably worthwhile getting my fitness power and just getting mm -hmm. your favorite foods and your favorite training foods and having a look at them and being like how much carbs is actually in that and be like okay and planning it okay hour one i'm going to consume my pre-training breakfast and then i should be pretty good as soon as I get into hour two, what's my carbohydrate strategy? Like, let's look up my favorite food. Okay. My favorite sports gel has 22 grams. Okay. I want to try and hit 40. What can I do to get roughly 18 more grams? Can Do I look at dried fruits? Do I look at cliff bars? Do I look at roll-ups? Whatever it is, jelly beans, whatever it is you want, just have a plan. And then each week when you're training, you're doing that longer session, modify it, modify the plan, take notes, see how you felt, play around. And then once you kind of get consistent with it, keep increasing increase and see how your gut feels and that's going to be important training your gut play around with it have fun because it does work it's just hard it just takes a little bit of extra work yeah definitely and you know sometimes depending on how long you're training or how often you're training you know you get sick of having a gel or you get sick of smashing okay. a fuel or whatever it is so being ex experimenting with types of foods you know having real foods whether that's a sandwich as opposed to 500 gels um so yeah they're all the types of things that you can get on my fitness pal try and find you know what's got how many carbs and then yeah, experiment with what you like. And then you're also gonna be getting those different types of, of carbohydrates. So as I mentioned, you know, carbohydrates are oxidized, meaning they're burned um, to create fuel. However, the rate of oxidation from these carbohydrates that we're coming from, that are coming from our food, sorry, are influenced by the types of carbohydrates that are available. So we've got different types of carbohydrates and, and the most simplest form of carbohydrate is a sugar. So you've probably heard about it, you know, back in school or biology or something, but we've got 
glucose, sucrose, fructose, we've got galactose, we've got all those different types of oses. Um, and the structure can actually impact the rate at which we can um, oxidize them for energy. So pretty much what the key takeaway from this is really going to be that if you're consuming over 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour, if that's your goal, you need to start having a multiple transport of carbohydrate, which means we're not just having glucose or we're not just having fructose, we're having a combination of the two. Um, so a combination of fructose and glucose is actually found to be the superior combination um, to increase carbohydrate oxidation rates during prolonged exercise. Um, it's also better tolerated by our gut. As you mentioned, Geordie, once you just keep smashing the same type of carbohydrate, it sits in your stomach and you feel like it's not doing anything, that's because of these types of transporters. So when we talk about um, multiple transporter carbohydrates. We have these little kind of channels in our gut. Um, they're called sodium glucose transporters. And what these do is they um, help to move glucose into the blood. So they've got funny little names, but one of them, um, our, one of our most popular kind of, I guess, important transporters is called SGLT1. And it's a sodium, a sodium glucose transporter. And this moves glucose into the cells. So this is where we can then use it for energy. However, at a certain point, this becomes the limiting factor, this transporter. So S the SJ SGLT1 transporter can only oxidize around 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour. So that's why we're saying once you hit that 60 gram mark, any more is probably not going to do you much good if you're looking at a chart in terms of oxid oxidation rates. It's going to start to plateau at around 60 grams because ingesting any more after that just becomes ineffective. So this is where fructose comes in because fructose being a different type of sugar uses a different transporter called GLUT5. And this means that then carbohydrates can kind of be oxidized through different avenues. Um, and this is probably gonna, you know, maybe go over a lot of people's heads, but I think a good way to kind of look at, look at it is if we think about like this analogy. So just say, you know, there's like a fire in a building or something and you're trying to get like a hundred people are trying to run out this door at once. Obviously, you know, there's gonna be a bit of a traffic jam. It's, uh, it's not gonna dark. be very efficient. We got like all these people running, trying to get through this door. Like it's only a little door. Um, However, someone's like, hey, there's another door here. Let's open it. You open two doors and then you've got your 100 people trying to get out way faster. It's way more efficient. So that's the way I like to think of it when we're talking about carbohydrates is, okay, once I get to that 60 gram mark, I'm kind of filling up this transporter. Like I need to open another channel. So you add fructose into the mix and then bam, you've got two gates where this glucose can be oxidized with fuel, which is going to be way more efficient. And it's going to increase your oxidation rates up to 120 grams of carbs per hour. So instead of, you know, not maximizing how much energy you could be using by combining the two carbohydrates, you're actually going to be way more efficient. You're going to be able to power harder for longer. And um, this is really important if you are having carbohydrate intakes over 60 grams an hour. How's the doom and gloom analogy from Loz where it's just people running from a burning building for their life? I've, <laughs> I've heard so many different ones like getting on a packed subway train or getting off a packed subway train, like everyone's oh, yeah, going true. off. And I, was, and I was always like, oh, it's pretty doomy and gloomy, like getting off a packed subway train, going to their workplace or whatever, but <laughs> running from a burning, yeah. burning building. Well, I was thinking like, in what instance would people just be running out of a building? You know, there's got to be some sort of like stimulus to to cause that havoc and everything. So that, that's the best I could do. <laughs> I mean, it, it gets the point across. There's three things that I, I do want to just touch on there quickly. And going yeah. back to the sodium... Uh, glucose like transporters the sglt-1 transporters this is kind of for people who are probably a bit more science minded or have a bit more knowledge about it something i've heard people say who probably aren't as educated because they say oh it's a sodium glucose transporter you have to have sodium with whatever glucose you have to get that transporter work. that's not true your body has your cells has that sodium in there already regardless of whether you put it in exogenously. So you don't have to put it in there. I've heard people say, you know, if you're training and you're trying to do this, then you have to put like a two to one ratio of sodium or whatever to get this transporter. But that's absolutely not true. It, the transporter will work absolutely fine with just the exogenous carbohydrates in there. The other thing that I think is important to talk about when you get up to these higher, these higher carbohydrate amounts is that yeah, it does help with the fueling, but we've got some studies now, especially that famous one from the Kona Ironman, mm -hmm. where the contestants who were getting up to 120 grams had less levels of the creatine kinase. And that's an enzyme that's indicative of muscle damage. So less muscle damage means better recovery. So the guys that were getting the higher carbohydrate amounts by the end of that race, 
they had less of that enzyme, which meant they had less muscle damage. So they are having better recovery. And I absolutely stand by that. I obviously conditioning is such a big thing, but once you start getting this right, you will feel it the next day because you'll feel it if you get it right one weekend and then you go out the next weekend and don't do it and you do the exact same run or the exact same ride, you will feel it the next day in your recovery. The only other thing that I'll say is that when you're eating that many carbohydrates, because getting 120 grams or 100, anything above 60 grams, I think is a fair amount on a practical yeah. side. And then if you do plan this out, like you've got a few hours, say you've got three, four, five, I find anything above four or five hours, I have to switch up the sweet and the savory because a mm. lot of people will always think, okay, if we're going to do this and we think carbohydrates, they instantly think sweet. And it's like, okay, cool. And that's great for a while. You will definitely get palate fatigue. Trust me, you will get palate fatigue. So have options, whether you've got, where you've got sweet options for like, say when you start, which a lot of people are fine, but you will get to a point, I guarantee you, you'll get to a point where you'd be like, oh my God, I cannot look at something sweet. And you've got to switch to savory options. So make sure you've got options and you practice using them as well. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you always find as well with sports drinks, like, cause if you're, if you're combining say fluid and solid carbohydrates as well, nine times out of 10, that drink's going to be sweet. You know, like I haven't come across yet a savory electrolyte beverage or a savory Gatorade. So it's like, you know, if, yeah, you are someone that gets flavor fatigue, imagine trying to have like a sweet muesli bowl, like a honey sandwich and your Gatorade, like, I don't know, for me, I just feel like it's, it's not the best combo. So that's a great idea. Find some savory snacks that work. Um, I guess some of the things that come to my mind would be, you know, like those salted, like flavored rice cakes and stuff, or um, mm. I don't know. I always think of pretzels, but then I think pretzels are also really dry, dry. and I would be concerned that during an event, my mouth would already be dry that I'm trying to munch on this pretzel. Um, even Vegemite sandwiches are good too, because then again, you're getting your sodium um, through and you're getting the carbs from the bread. But have you found any of your kind of favorite go-to savory snacks, Jordy? Yeah, I'm, I'm big on like the the light crisp. I don't know if anyone, if that's just an Aussie thing, but they're, they're just like, what are they, rice cake crisp? I, I guess it's the best yeah. way to describe them. Or having rice cakes and adding, especially with the longer ones, adding like a bit of peanut butter and, as yeah. opposed to something like honey just to take away the sweetness. I am big mm -hmm. on uh, Vegemite, to be honest. I've, lately, I've been getting into Vegemite or Marmite or what, what do they call it in the UK? What do they call Vegemite? Yeah, it's Marmite, I think. Marmite. Marmite. Promite, yeah, yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. It's just like this black, yeasty, very salty, savory thing. But yeah. play around with it because, uh, or even cliff bars, you can get certain cliff bars that aren't as um, sweet mm -hmm. and they're way, way, way less sweeter than like other certain um, gels and like uh, blocks or whatever else you can get. Mm -hmm. So play around with it, get some savory snacks in there because, especially if you do those longer ones, there is nothing worse than like getting to a station or getting to a stop and being like, okay, cool, I get there get to finally put some fuel in. I'm looking forward to this. And you're like, oh God, like I've got to do like dried apricots or dried mango or I've got to yeah. do like jam, jam on bread again. And you're like, far out, like I cannot. And just it makes the next like 20Ks <laughs> or whatever you're doing, like kind of miserable. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I don't know if I'm like weird for doing it, but even sometimes before training, you know, if like I'm not going to have like train aid or Gatorade or something, I'll make like say jam on toast or like a jam sandwich or something. And I just crack some salt into it, <laughs> like just as well yeah. to kind of take away the sweetness. So if anyone's listening as well, you know, like that's a super easy way to one, kind of counteract the sweetness of your foods and to add some additional salt. Um, because yeah, if you're training in a super hot environment, that extra salt isn't going to go astray. So always a good little life hack I find is like having like a honey sandwich with some salt cracked in there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I played around with for a while, which worked really well, is just making like unflavored mini pancakes and I oh, just perfect. make them salted. And so I just get like protein powder, get them in there. Obviously, you've got like the flour and whatnot. And if you want to get it sweeter, add some fruits and whatever in there. But I kind of just make it as is and then just crack a bunch of salt in there. So it is kind of salty and a bit more savory. And you can use other spreads or whatnot. Awesome pancakes. On top so of that. Some Vegemite on them, some little Vegemite pancakes. <laughs> yeah, they kind of like come out more like a scone, I guess, in, yeah, yeah. in a way, but just not as dry. So it's, um, yeah, it's way easier to get down. Hmm. There's some good strategies. Yeah, well, and if anybody else has some good savory strategies, like send us a message or DM us or something and we can compile a list of us savory snack options because, yeah, it's so much easier to find sweet ones over savory ones. <laughs> but pretty much, yeah, the aim of the game with our um, intra-training nutrition is depending on the rate, the duration, sorry, of your event, you want to be trying to aim for at least 30 grams of carbs per hour. And that could be up to 90 grams, up to 120 grams. If you're, um, you know, good at tolerating your carbohydrates and remembering that once we hit that 60 gram mark, it's really important to combine your 
glucose and your fructose. So for example, it could be like your rice cakes with your honey because um, fructose are the things that are like the naturally occurring sugars. So things come from, from, coming from our fruits, our maple syrups, our honey, et cetera. Um, so combining the two are going to help open up those extra doors. Just try and think about all those people escaping the fire. You want to try and make it as efficient as possible. You want to get the energy burned as quickly as possible. So by opening that second door, we're going to be oxidizing energy. And ultimately what this is trying to do is spare our body having to use our muscle glycogen stores for as long as possible, because we all know that that muscle glycogen depletion is what for some reason causes us to be so fatigued during these events. So that's what we're trying to prolong, um, especially, you know, you're doing a full Ironman or something, you could be getting up to 10 hours, 13 hours. That's a lot of exercise. You know, that's a lot of fuel your body needs um, exogenously. So that's our carbohydrates from food. Yeah. And I think the last point, we've got here that we'll finish off on is this carbohydrate yeah. mouth rinse. What are yeah. your thoughts on this? Liz? Have you tried it during training or have you played around? I, um, with it? I mean, I'm never in a situation that, you know, if I train at a CrossFit gym or something, like I'm not just going to spit my Gatorade out on the floor. <laughs> my coach would die. He hates it if there's chalk on the floor, let alone me walking around like spitting my Gatorade on the floor. <laughs> but um, I think the first time I ever heard about this was back in uni, like doing a sports nutrition subject or something. And I thought it was super interesting because, you know, you watch the footy and like people, like the players, they'll put Gatorade in their mouth or something they'll squish it and then they spit it out and until I learned about it I always used to think what are they doing can't they just swallow it or something like that um but ultimately what this does is like there's quite a bit of kind of research into it if you're interested have a read it's pretty cool but um ultimately by having like rinsing your mouth with a carbohydrate rich drink you have receptors in your mouth um which can send a positive signal to the brain and and kind of counteract those you know negative feelings or like feelings of fatigue and everything um and we all know you know if we have some chocolate or if we have some cake it kind of sends off those receptors in our brain we feel good we feel happy um so regardless if it is a placebo effect or if it's an actual effect um ultimately having that carbohydrate rinse one it's less kind of gut upset because you don't have to have this fluid in your stomach um and two it just sends like a positive signal to the brain um it's kind of how i guess i take it i think it's pretty cool interesting i suppose but yeah if you're doing a full ironman you don't want to just be doing a, a carbohydrate mouth rinse but maybe if you're doing a sprint try you know you could just have some or when you're running um, and you're picking something up from the aid station and you just think, holy crap, I can't swallow right now. Grab the Coke or grab the Gatorade, swish it around in your mouth for a bit, spit it out and keep running. Um, it's going to be better than trying to just sip on some water. But yeah, what are your thoughts, Jordy? Yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts on it. When I first yeah. learned about it, I thought it was the biggest load of BS. <laughs> and I was like, it makes no sense. And I held that thought for a very long time because I, I used to play rugby and be one of those guys that would just swish and spit. And I really did not find it made any difference. That's anecdotal, which is not great. Mm -hmm. It makes sense though, like physiologically, like we do have receptors in our mouth. We have a whole system of like enzymes that start breaking down sugars, mm -hmm. like amylases in our, in our mouth that already break it down. And it's so close to our brain that our, the whole idea is that if we put it in our mouth, swish it around, spit it out, we hit the, all of these receptors and our brain goes, oh, cool, there's there's glucose and sugars coming down to our stomach and into our intestine. And it goes, oh, awesome. And it hits those reward systems. Since I've been doing um, ultra endurance, I a thousand percent agree with it. I absolutely agree with it now, but I think it is effective only when you are pretty, pretty stuffed, when you're pretty tired and you're running low on those stores because yeah. it does, it's an instant relief. Like if you stop and you have a Gatorade or a sports drink or whatever, and you do swish it and you spit it out, there is like an instant like dopamine. You do mm -hmm. feel it. And I'm talking like this is hours and hours and hours and hours in the training. So I think maybe what I experienced back when I was just playing like a rugby game for what's that, like 80 minutes or whatever. And it's like, stop, start. You're not that stuffed. It's like, you're probably not as like prone to get it or primed to get it. But when you're in those longer endurance events, absolutely. And I think that's a big one as well that you mentioned is you do get to a point if you're being diligent with your fluids that like, you just, Oh, I just don't want to put any more fluids in right now. Or it's just like, I don't really want to do it. Or maybe you see, you've got a big hill coming up. And you're like, oh, I don't want to like have fluids in sloshing around, but like I want yeah. to pep. So like do it and swish it up and get that. And it, it does help where you get to the top of the hill and you're like, okay, I got to keep going, swish and then spit and just keep going. And maybe that's the difference to get you back into your, out of your hiking and back into your running or whatever it is. Yeah. I think now it uh, absolutely does work. Yeah, I was very skeptical on it for years and years. And then um, a big reason why I was skeptical on it because I tried it with our combat athletes when they were cutting weight. Oh, yeah. And then I tried doing it myself, like thinking, okay, if we're cutting weight in the sauna and we're dehydrated, 
maybe this is something that'll give them a pep and it was the worst thing ever. Like they've just got, they're already <laughs> depleted and then you're giving them this like really sugary drink and they can't have too much fluid. And then you're asking them to swish it around their mouth and spit it out. It's just like so much added torture for them. Yeah, I did it like two or three times and then I just scrapped it from the protocol because it like you could tell you were putting these guys through so much torture. That's how but- I feel every time I walk past a bakery as a celiac. I know for a fact they're not going to have any gluten-free pastries or armor croissants. And I walk past that bakery being like, this smells amazing amazing and then I just know I can't have any of it so yeah I feel like that's probably how your fighters would feel if you're making them swish around this delicious sugary beverage that they just have to spit out and be dehydrated <laughs> yeah that, yeah so that didn't stay on the protocol too long <laughs> yeah well you know what all these things are tried and tested so you've got to you've got to experiment to see if it works or if it doesn't yeah no absolutely but I think that's a pretty good we'll wrap that one up there Loz any uh final remarks or anything you want to finish on no, no final remarks. Stick around for the next few. We'll talk about electrolytes and fluid. And we're also going to talk about um, the role of fat and also manipulating carbohydrates because you probably heard us say for the, what is it? 17,002 second time. <laughs> carbs, are, carbs are king and training up. But, um, you know, there are actually some, some strategies where we talk about low carbohydrate diets for athletes. So we're going to talk about that soon. But yeah, stick around. And as always, I guess, tune into our socials um, if you want to keep seeing me ride a bike and talk and yeah all that jazz extra content so cool